Hey guys, it's Ryan. Um, welcome back. Uh, sorry it's been a while. Um, I got a new computer and a new microphone, so maybe you'll notice a little bit of a change in the audio quality, hopefully for the better. Um, this will be the first of many videos on a really cool topic, oral pathology. This is something that comes up on NBDE Part 2, on the ADAT, the CETA, DSC, and even uh, Part 1 of the boards. And of course, this is something that will come in handy when working with patients, recognizing when something seems off and knowing when to biopsy. But I'm gearing these videos for preparing for the exams I mentioned, especially Part 2 of the National Boards. I'll be focusing on only the highest yield things you should know for each condition. If you like this type of info, you may want to check out Mosby's review for the NBDE Part 2. Much of the info I'll be going over is adapted from that book, and I'll leave a link in the description below for, for you to check it out. So these are all of the categories we're going to be talking about one video at a time, and it's organized by tissue type and then by the type of lesion, reactive, infectious, immunologic, and so on. Uh, basically, you can kind of think of it like we're starting with developmental conditions, um, things that um, are either soft or hard tissue defects that occur during the development of an individual, either before or after birth. Then we go over um, basically going from outside to inside, from mucosa, then we go to submucosa and glands, then we talk about the teeth, and then we talk about bone. And finally, we'll go over hereditary conditions that are passed on through genes. So let's begin. So the first one we're going to talk about is cleft lip, approximately 1 in 1,000 births, so relatively rare. Um, unilateral is about 80% of the time, whereas bilateral is only about 20% of the time, so you're going to see unilateral more often with cleft lip. And most importantly, this is a lack of fusion between the medial nasal process and the maxillary process. So if we look at um, this uh, image down here, that's basically between this uh, philtrum area, which is under the middle of the nose, and the lateral lip cheek area. So this is between the medial nasal process and the maxillary process or prominence, which are embryologic structures that will eventually fuse together to form the face. And this is a lack of fusion of those embryological structures. And then cleft lip is approximately 1 in 2,000 births, so a little bit more rare than cleft lip. And it's a lack of fusion between palatal shelves, which makes sense because it's the cleft palate. So then we can look at this view over here. This is looking at um, the roof of the mouth, and you can see how a unilateral cleft will go off to one side and kind of uh, coalesce with one of the nostrils. And the bilateral cleft will go and split the palate in two with this inner maxillary segment separated in the bilateral cleft because this, again, involves middle nose, the philtrum, middle of the lip, and the inner maxillary segment, which is part of the medial nasal process. So the two palatal shelves are on either side of that. Uh, cleft. Then lip pits are invaginations at either the commissures, which are the corners of the mouth, or near the midline. Now all the syndromes that I'm going to be talking about in this oral pathology video series, I'll have them bolded and I'll kind of list them as sort of a math equation. Basically an addition of the sum of a certain amount of uh, conditions that need to be met for it to be considered a syndrome. So, um, and I may not pronounce all these correct, so sorry about that. But the Vanderwood syndrome involves um, both a cleft, either lip or palate or both, and the presence of lip pits, as seen in this picture. Now, Fordyce granules are ectopic sebaceous glands. If you remember this, it's probably all you need to know. Um, they're completely benign, no treatment necessary at all, um, but that's sufficient to know. And sort of knowing this pretty classic condition, either on buccal mucosa or labial, labial mucosa inside the lips, those are the characteristic locations for these kind of things. Leukoedema is another thing, just to know a couple of 
um, key buzz phrases for it. Um, it's basically this white, or in this picture, whitish gray, edematous, which means fluid, the collection of fluid, lesion of buccal mucosa. So again, very common in buccal mucosa, and it dissipates when the cheek is stretched. So if you take two fingers, stretch this out, the lesions looks like it kind of goes away for a brief moment. And that's because of the collection of this edematous, um, this fluid in this area. Lingual thyroid um, is a thyroid tissue mass at the midline base of the tongue. And importantly, it's located along the embryonic path of thyroid descent. So if we look at this um, diagram of thyroid descent, we don't need to know all the specifics, but it starts out at the foramen cecum of the tongue, the midline base of the tongue. And um, during development, it goes down, it wraps around the hyoid bone, it goes down a little bit further, and eventually ends up where the thyroid should be. And that is uh, below the laryngeal cartilage area around the trachea, but it can get stuck anywhere along this path of descent. So it could just not go anywhere and get stuck in uh, the back of the tongue like this, or it could end up somewhere along that path at, say, the neck area. And so a thyroid, thyroid glossal duct cyst is an example of this. So this would be a midline neck swelling, and again, located along the embryonic path of thyroid descent. So lingual, thi lingual thyroid and thyroglossal duct cysts are manifestations of an improper um, path of the thyroid. Geographic tongue also goes by two other names, benign migratory glossitis and erythema migrans. And sometimes the, the alternative names are sort of uh, cumbersome, but in this case, it actually helps, helps us remember what it looks like and how it acts. So this is a pretty uh, nice characteristic photo has these white um, annular lesions, which means they're white rings surrounding central red islands that literally migrate over time and they'll move around on the tongue. And this is how you get this migratory migrans um, terminology and also the erythema referring to the redness of the tongue. Occasionally hurts and burns. Unfortunately, outside of a little bit of symptomatic and dietary changes, there really is no treatment for this condition. Fissured tongue is uh, relatively uh, more common than some of the other ones we talked about. Um, has the folds and furrows of the tongue dorsum, the, the top surface of the tongue here. More important, it's involved in this syndrome called Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome and has fissured tongue, granulomatous chelitis, which is basically lip inflammation involving granulomas, granulation tissue, and facial paralysis. Um, how I remember this is um, this, uh, it's not an, not an acronym, but a helpful uh, way to think about this is MELS, MELS Bells. So you can think of uh, Melkerson, and um, Bell's, referring to Bell's palsy, which is another type of facial paralysis involving the facial nerve. And you can think of rose or rosy red, and that would be referring to the Rosenthal part of the syndrome and the redness that's affecting the lips because this granulomatous colitis is basically this lip inflammation that involves red, swollen lips. So if you think about the Bell's, Bell's palsy, facial paralysis, rosy red, red lips, colitis, meaning lip inflammation, you can kind of put all this stuff together maybe a little bit better. So hopefully that helps you remember um, some of these weirder name syndromes. I'll try to throw in some helpful things to kind of, or silly things to help remember it. So next we're going to talk about angioma. So this is a kind of, it was confusing for me because there are a bunch of different types of angiomas and I couldn't really get a grasp on what they all were because they're very different in presentation. 
But if we break this word down, angi is a prefix meaning vessels, and oma is a suffix meaning a tumor. So literally, it's translated to a tumor composed of blood vessels or lymph vessels. There are two types of vessels in the human body. So any angioma is either going to be a tumor of blood vessels or lymph vessels. A cherry angioma is extremely common, super benign. Uh, most of us have them somewhere, and it's basically a red mole. So it, it, an incredibly, really it sounds silly to call it a tumor, but an incredibly small tumor of um, small little capillaries and blood vessels that accumulate and just form this small little mole on our skin. A hemangioma is a congenital focal proliferation of capillaries. So again, it's involving blood vessels, but a little bit larger scale. Now most undergo involution as an infant or child ages, but persistent lesions um, should be excised, mostly for um, aesthetic reasons. So we have cherry angioma, hemangioma, and now lymphangioma. So we talked about the blood vessel proliferation, and now let's talk about congenital focal proliferation of lymph vessels. So oral lymphangiomas are actually super rare. They um, manifest as these little purple spots on the tongue. Uh, more common would probably be um, when it occurs on the neck. Um, it looks, it's just basically a, another neck swelling, and it's called a cystic hygroma. So that one's kind of a little bit different um, nomenclature, but cystic hygroma is technically a lymphangioma of the neck. Um, and again, we have another syndrome, this time Sturge-Weber syndrome, and this involves angiomas of the leptomeninges, which are the arachnoid and pia mater, and just for reference, they're the two um, most internal of the uh, meninges. And then um, they also, the syndrome also involves angiomas of the skin along the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So V1, V2, V3. Um, the angiomas uh, of, of this syndrome can also be referred to as encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis. That's really, it sounds really complicated, but encephalo, referring to brain, trigeminal, referring to this nerve, and angiomatosis, just referring to the presence of angiomas in relation to those uh, structures. So Sturge-Weber syndrome, all about angiomas. Next we have exostoses and tori, and this is the excessive cortical bone growth seen in these pictures. So this, um, they're basically named based on where they occur. This would be a buccal exostosis, a very uh, severe one in this case. And this would be a palatal torus. Uh, again, pretty, pretty severe. They're usually not quite um, this large, but just for um, picture's sake, um, that's, those are two examples. Next, we have a dermoid cyst, and this is a mass in the midline and it can be either intraoral or extraoral. It depends on the location where the cyst um, originates. So if it originates uh, above the mylohyoid muscle, it presents in the floor of the mouth, like seen here. If it develops below the mylohyoid, then it would be a mass, another, yet another mass in the upper neck. So as you can, as you can see here, there are quite a few um, of these cysts and developmental conditions that manifest um, not only intraorally, but also cervically in the neck. So a dermoid cyst is pretty interesting. Uh, it contains any uh, variety of adnexal structures, which include like hair, sebaceous glands, seminiferous glands, and so on. Um, and it has, most importantly in these exams, it seems to like to talk about doughy consistency, um, especially compared to a ranula, which is something we'll talk about in another video. But this cyst, in comparison to a ranula, which also presents in the floor of the mouth, has a doughy consistency, and that's because of the things that it contains within it. Next, we have the branchial cyst, and this is also um, very often contradicted 
to um, the thyroglossal duct cyst, which was the midline neck swelling. This is the lateral neck swelling. And it's because it's related to um, the branchial arches, which are synonymous with the pharyngeal arches, which are part of the head and neck embryology. Um, it's an epithelial cyst within a lymph node of the neck. And you can think of when the doctor palpates around, um, around your neck, they're always running their fingers along uh, the lateral aspect of the neck. So that's why uh, you can connect that to why the branchial cyst is on the lateral side. Also remember that all cysts, by definition, have an epithelial lining. Um, so all the cysts we've talked about have epithelial lining. This one, in this case, is stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, I don't think that's too important, but uh, just, just for your own edification, I guess. And next we have oral lymphoepithelial cysts, which is basically the equivalent, um, the intraoral equivalent of the branchial cyst, because now it's also an epithelial cyst within lymphoid tissue. This time it's in oral mucosa, not on the lateral neck. So if you think of lymphoid tissue uh, intraorally, the palatine and lingual tonsils come to mind. And so those are the most common regions that these little cysts are found. Next is Staphne bone defect, which is a, seems to be a really a real favorite of test uh, makers. And it's a radiolucency in the posterior mandible below the mandibular canal. And it looks like it could be a cyst. It almost looks like it's corticated in this image, but it's not. It's due to the lingual concavity of the jaw just um, being so severe that it appears on an x-ray, this case um, in a panoramic. Um, and it just it seems like it's something that should be investigated, but it's actually just um, a variation of normal anatomy. Nasopalatine duct cyst is a characteristically heart-shaped radiolucency in the nasopalatine canal. It's caused by cystification of canal remnants. Um, treatment for this would be surgical excision. Globulomaxillary lesion is a fancy clinical term denoting any radiolucency between, and this is very specific, the maxillary canine and the maxillary lateral incisor. Um, that's very specific, and this is not a diagnosis. The other things we've talked about are diagnoses. This is just a clinical description of this um, exact manifestation. And lastly, we have traumatic bone cyst, which is another favorite of test makers. Um, it's also called simple bone cyst and idiopathic bone cavity, which are important synonyms. It's a large radiolucency, and it scallops around roots. That's probably the most important thing you need to know about this one. Um, it does not have an epithelial lining. Um, so like the other ones, the other cysts, I said they do have an epithelial lining. This is technically a pseudocyst. It's, although it's named a cyst, it's not technically, by definition, a cyst. Um, it's usually in the mandible of teenagers associated with some sort of jaw trauma by sports or something like that. The treatment would be to aspirate first, um, determine that it's fluid filled, it has blood in it, and then just um, monitor. And this thing is, um, there's typically nothing to worry too much about. All right, and that's it for developmental conditions. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like what I do on this channel, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more oral pathology and other things dentistry. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you all next time.